Good evening, comrades. Thank you very much for joining us to this uh, next session in our series on Israel-Palestine. Tonight, we're looking at uh, the Balfour Declaration, the Ottoman Empire, or the other way around, and um, Zionism before the foundation of Israel in, in, in 1948. Um, bear with us. Both our speakers are not 100%. You might have seen that Tony was arrested yesterday on anti-terrorism charges. Very serious, I'm sure, for one tweet. Comrades will have probably seen seen it absolutely absurd. We're very glad you uh, managed to, to join us despite the fact that your phone and computer were confiscated. So yeah. comrades, this is not going to be um, quite as planned, but we're very pleased you were both able to make it. So the format is we're going to have Tony first for 20, 25 minutes, then Tom and then we're going to open up for questions on contributions from the floor. So thank you very much, Tony and Tom, for, for joining us. Over to you, Tony. Okay, right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you uh, for all of you attending, nearly 80 people now, in fact. Uh, as Tina said, I uh, was subject to a seven o'clock raid. Uh, at my house and they confiscated all my computers, my mobile, everything. So I've spent much of today trying to get back online uh, and I've had very little chance uh, to uh, prepare for this talk. So really it's going to be a stream of consciousness as much as anything else. Uh, and then we can take questions and so on. The Ottoman Empire, uh, I won't confess to knowing a great deal about it. It's not my area of speciality, but it ruled from approximately 15, I think 12, uh, to 1917 uh, in Palestine. And it was a vast brawling empire. It was dominant in much of uh, Europe until it was thrown out. I think it reached its epiphany, epiphany in the unsuccessful siege of Vienna. Uh, and they were slowly forced to retreat. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it occupied vast ways uh, of the Middle East and the Arab East. Uh, and it was called uh, the sick man of Europe uh, because it was really an ancien uh, regime, in many ways, a feudal empire uh, that was busily trying to uh, modernize uh, and the political expression of that was the Young Turk Rebellion, I think, in 1908. Uh, as regards Palestine, uh, I think the crucial date probably really is 1858 with the introduction of the land code uh, into Palestine, because previously land had been held by hamulas or villages, uh, really collectively. There was no individual title to them. Uh, and the peasants farmed them uh, collectively. But the 1858 uh, land code of the Ottoman Empire introduced individual registration of land and uh, in the process co uh, confiscated large swathes of that land uh, as so-called waste land. Uh, and that incidentally was the basis for much of the later Zionist uh, colonization and justification of seizing of land as well. Uh, I mean, this really represented the intrusion of a uh, Western capital into uh, the place, into the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and the land increasingly became part of, a, if you like, the market economy. Uh, it became owned because uh, you had to individually register the land after 1858. And many peasants couldn't even afford the registration fee. And it fell into the hands of uh, very large, often absentee landlords like uh, Sir Suck uh, of uh, Lebanon, Beirut, uh, who in turn sold large chunks of it, especially in the Jezreel Valley, uh, to the Zionists, enabling Zionist colonization to build up. But I say, uh, Ot the Ottoman Empire uh, was called the sick man of Europe. It was massively in debt uh, to the European powers. Uh, the, People may know Theodore Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, when he travelled to Constantinople uh, and entered into talks with the Ottoman Sultan 
offered, and I don't think he had much backing for this, uh, but to, to take on uh, at least part of the debt and uh, it promised that the debt would be met if uh, the Ottomans uh, agreed to uh, grant a charter uh, for Zionist colonization. Nothing much uh, became of that. But to say uh, the European powers, in particular France, Britain and Germany, got their claws into the Ottoman Empire. And they did this by sponsorship of the various uh, religious uh, interests. The Germans, for instance, uh, there was quite a large scale colonization of the Templars, the Knights of the Templars, uh, the French, uh, the Germans, the British and the Russians, each had their own favorite church. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church was one, the Greek Orthodox Church was another. And through uh, religious interests, which often brought up large tracts of land as well, uh, they increased in their political influence. The Zionists themselves, uh, for those uh, who are interested in the colonization, the, the, main, the first alley or the first wave of emigration from uh, Europe to Palestine began uh, with, in 1882, following the Odessa pogroms. Uh, although the first Jewish settlement was in Petah Tikva in 1878, if I'm right. Uh, and these settlements soon ran into trouble because they weren't productive and Baron Edmund Rothschilds soon took over the finance and the reorganization of them in introducing land management. But the differences between these settlements and if you like the true Zionist colonization was that the administrators and the settlers preferred not to work on the land, but to employ Palestinian peasants uh, because it was much cheaper to do so and they reaped the rewards uh, from that. Uh, the difference uh, for purposes of uh, Zionist colonization, and that began in earnest with the second Aliyah, the Labour Zionist colonization in 1904, was that the settlers themselves did the work and therefore did not need to employ Arab labor. And in fact, they adopted the policy of Kibush Havada, uh, the conquest of labor. And what this meant in essence was that once uh, a tract of land had been bought from an absentee landlord usually. Uh, instead of the peasants being evicted from, uh, if you like, sharecropping or farming it and then being re-employed as landless labourers, instead what happened was they were not employed at all. They were simply evicted from the premises altogether. Uh, and this caused uh, bitter disputes, uh, it was uh, assassinations of many settlers, the formation of uh, Jewish or Zionist militias. Bar Giora, I think in 1903, was the first. Hashomer in 1908, and then Haganah, uh, which was the main Zionist terror army in 1920, formed directly by the Histadrut, uh, the Zionist trade union. And it, I think it has to be understood in terms of uh, we often refer, or people often refer to the Labour Zionists as the left wing of the Zionists because they believed they had a, a Marx phraseology, Borachovism, Paul Zion was formerly Marxist. But their Marxism and their socialism was confined to the settlers themselves. It, it never applied to the Arabs. And the conference uh, in 1906 of Palestine, uh, the Palestinian Paul Zion, uh, the main Labour Zionists, party. There was a bitter dispute by, between Abraham Savransky uh, and David Ben-Gurion, who became the first prime minister of Israel, as to whether they should organize with Arab labor. Savransky and others uh, supported joint work with the Arabs, because this was in line, of course, with uh, socialist ideals. But those led by Ben-Gurion, who were in the majority, did not want to organize the labor at all. They argued that uh, socialism only applied to workers who were already employed, not those who were, who were excluded from the workforce altogether. So you see the development of Zionist apartheid uh, from its beginnings. But it, during the Ottoman Empire, I mean, the Ottomans, uh, tolerated, sometimes they supported, sometimes they didn't, uh, the Zionist colonizers, they hadn't had official permission, but they, they didn't really need so. Sometimes uh, impediments were put in their way, 
uh, such as having to adopt Ottoman citizenship. But many of these restrictions were not enforced, not least because of the representation of the European powers who held sway over the Ottoman Empire in many ways, not least uh, financially. And so we really come to uh, the Balfour Declaration itself, and people uh, will uh, may recall uh, what it said. But uh, there was a period of lobbying. It went on from about 1915, 1916, by, uh, led by Herbert Samuel, Sir Herbert Samuel, who was a Home Secretary under the Liberals, uh, and later became the first British High Commissioner. He was an ardent Zionist. Uh, and in 1917, the War Cabinet under Lloyd George agreed to the Balfour Declaration, which is the British uh, promising the land of another people uh, to the Zionist organisation, although, they, of course, they had no right to do that. This was in blatant contradiction, I should add, of the Mahan Hussein uh, correspondence in 1915-16. Sir Henry McMahon was the High Commissioner in Egypt uh, and Faisal Hussein was uh, the father of Abdullah and uh, Faisal, uh, who later became monarchs in their own right. Uh, and in essence, although, although it was vaguely worded, it was quite clear that the British promised independence to the Arab state uh, that would be formed in Palestine if they were successful. This was in the, as part and parcel of the negotiations, uh, which uh, Lawrence of Arabia made uh, famous, uh, whereby the Arabs of Arabia uh, would join forces with the British. However, what wasn't realised at the time was that the British, who of course are known as uh, perfidious Albion, uh, had already negotiated or in the process of negotiating what became known as the sykes pico Agreement. Sir Henry Sykes, a uh, famous British diplomat and adventurer and so on, and Pico, the French, I think, foreign minister, whereby Palestine and the Middle East, Syria, were divided into severe of influence, into severe of spheres of influence. Uh, Syria and Lebanon were to be allocated to the French uh, and Palestine, uh, which at that time uh, also included Transjordan, uh, was to be allocated to the British. So uh, we had the usual double dealing by British imperialism, uh, having made promises, they failed to keep them. It's interesting uh, to note that, uh, I mean, people often see uh, Jewish influence at work, but the British, the British Jewish community was vehemently opposed to the Balfour Declaration, and in particular, the Board of Deputies. Uh, a famous letter was sent to the Times over the head uh, under the names of, uh, I think, the chair of the, the president of the Board of Deputies and the chair of the Anglo-Jewish uh, Association, Claude Montefiore uh, and Alexander. Uh, and there was a heated debate over that letter, in fact, at the Board of Deputies. But it's interesting to note that in the War Cabinet, uh, which approved the Balfour Declaration, the only dissentient voice was of its only Jewish member, Edwin Montague, a liberal member who later became a high commissioner or viceroy, I know, high commissioner, I think it was, uh, no, secretary of state, that's right, for India. So uh, the, the Anglo-Jewish bourgeoisie was uh, vehemently opposed uh, to the Balfour Declaration. And in fact, they formed an organization after the war, uh, the League of British Jews, precisely to campaign against the Balfour Declaration uh, and the consequent Zionist colonization. Uh, reasons are many uh, given for the Balfour Declaration, such as winning over the Jews of Russia because of the Bol Bolshevik Revolution, which took place almost at the same time, winning the support of American Jews for the war effort, uh, oil interests in the Middle East to secure those. But I, I think the main uh, reason uh, was, which was given by Chaim Weizmann, the first president of the Israeli state, uh, was protection of the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was the main artery for trade uh, and the shortest route uh, between Britain 
uh, and India, India being the jewel in the crown of the empire at that time. I mean, it's still a very important route, uh, let's be quite clear, but at that time it was even more important because the only alternative route was around the Cape of Good Hope, uh, which was much more expensive and time consuming. So guarding the Suez Canal and having a friendly settler state adjacent to it was extremely important to British imperialism. Uh, and thus the establishment of a, a Jewish settler state uh, was of prime importance. If, if I just read what the Balfour Declaration says, uh, I mean, you'll see again, I mean, uh, really the dishonesty because the British were quite happy uh, to see a Jewish state, but of course that wasn't mentioned. What the Balfour Declaration said was His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, which is a strange way of describing the vast majority of people, the Arab peoples uh, of Palestine, or the rights and the political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. The latter phrase, of course, refers to uh, the disquiet, to say the least, expressed by most Jews, that if there was a Jewish state uh, in Palestine, uh, then that would be an invitation to countries to get rid of their Jewish population on the grounds that it was a state already made for them and there was no need for them to stay any longer. And in fact, that is the main reason why anti-Semites uh, have always supported Zionism, that uh, the idea of a state where you can send your unwanted Jews to is particularly attractive to them. So this was uh, the Balfour Declaration, but Balfour himself, uh, made his views quite clear uh, later on when he said that Zionism being a far profounder import than the desires than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. So, I mean, he was clear. I mean, Balfour was a, a notorious imperialist. He started off as chief secretary in Ireland and he was known as Bloody Balfour after uh, the police shot three demonstrators at Mitchellstown, Cork, uh, I think it was about 1885, uh, and he expressed himself in the House of Commons as believing that black people were inherently inferior in terms of intelligence and so on. Uh, a, a view which wasn't particularly popular even at that time when colonialism uh, was in its heyday. So Balfour was a thoroughly reactionary uh, fellow, which is why he is a hero to this day of uh, the Zionist movement. Uh, he prefigured it in so many ways. And so the Balfour Declaration really gave way. It was approved by the uh, League of Nations in, in uh, 1922. It gave way to the Palestine Mandate, which existed from uh, what uh, officially 1922-23 right up to 1948 when uh, the State of Israel uh, was declared. Uh, the British uh, played their normal role, I mean, both dividing and ruling, setting Jew against Arab, uh, but always uh, mindful of their own interests. Uh, the Zionists uh, fought bitterly uh, to ensure that there was no democratic legislative assembly uh, for Palestine as long as they were in a minority, because uh, the British uh, even in India and other uh, colonies, ten, it would, under pressure, establish some form of legislative assembly. It didn't have uh, sovereignty, of course, uh, but it was, if you like, the beginnings uh, of a, a kind of democratic control of those countries, and they turned into parliaments uh, in, the, in, due, uh, in due course. But the Zionists were implacably opposed to any self-government of Palestine as long as they were a settler minority. Uh, and we see uh, continuous riots and conflicts between the Zionist settlers uh, and the existing population. It should be said, I mean, the, 
the Zionists were about half the Jewish population in 1918, which was about 80,000. Uh, they were opposed by the existing Jewish communities in Palestine, which had become very integrated. And when Arab nationalism first reared its head in Palestine, and it, it can be said, I think, with a certain amount of justice, that the main element crystallizing Palestinian consciousness, because the uh, Arabs up to that time would be divided into Bedouin, Circassian, and so on, uh, because it was a feudal economy. I mean, the main element in crystallizing the Palestinian and Arab nationalist consciousness was unwittingly Zionism itself. Uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt, and that's true often of other British colonies as well. Uh, but in the first manifestations of Arab nationalism, they appeal to Jew, to Muslims, Christians, and Jews, Jewish citizens, because Jews, for instance, in Jerusalem, by the mid 19th century, formed a majority of people. But because there'd been a tradition going back a few hundred years for Orthodox Jews to emigrate uh, from Europe to Palestine, they were living on charity and they died there, but they had no political aspirations separate from the people around them. Uh, and Jerusalem itself was a, a complex web of different, I mean, a, a mosaic of different religious uh, groups and peoples, but uh, they got on pretty yep. well until uh, the Zionists, who made it clear from the start uh, that uh, they believed in Jewish supremacy, they were there to replace the Palestinian Arabs, not to uh, work alongside them. The Zionist trade union, Hister Druk, didn't accept Arab members. It had a separate Arab wing, but in practice, it, 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 it amounted to nothing. So, I mean, the Zionists pursued from the start a policy of apartheid, and this led to uh, riots in 1920, 21, and again in 1929, uh, a, a dispute over uh, the Western Wall, the so-called uh, last wall of the temple, we don't know whether that's true or not, uh, but they were particularly vicious riots and about two, three hundred people died. Uh, and the British, as a result of that, uh, commissioned a, a report, the Hope Simpson uh, Commission of Inquiry, the Hope Simpson Report. And I actually advise anyone who is interested in, in what was happening and the, the mechanics of alienation uh, of the Palestinians and the Arabs, to actually read that report because it is extremely good. It lays out very clearly the hypocrisy of the Zionists. We talked about peace and goodwill to all men and women, but uh, they were steadily displacing uh, the Arabs from the economy uh, as a precursor to displacing them from the country altogether. Uh, the commission, there was just one dissenting member because it it found in favour of what the Palestinians were saying, and that was the Labour Party member. So you might want to bear that in mind when you think about Keir Starmer today being a Zionist without qualification. So, I mean, that was the mandate, but the British uh, enabled the Zionist militias to arm, and they trained them. And then in 1936 to 39 revolt, uh, they formed the Jewish Settlement Police. The Haganah were given pride of place. And so really the British prepared the Zionist militias and enabled the Zionist militias uh, to reach a strength such that they were able uh, to carry out the Nakba in 1947 and 48. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, say so the Balfour Declaration was a pivotal document in the history of the British Empire and in Palestine in particular. Uh, and like uh, most things, uh, it was, dishonest from the start. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how long I've been. About 20 minutes. Is 25 it? minutes, but that was right. that was fantastic. Thank you very much, sure. um, Tony. Um, Tom, do you want to just um, speak a little bit and then we can sure. ask you some questions? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes. And thank you, Tony. Just to um, add a little bit to what Tony was saying about the Ottoman Empire, in my view, even more than than uh, in the past, given the genocide that's ongoing now, all history should be directed towards uh, its its use as a tool against what's happening now. So 
if I think of the Ottoman Empire, what comes to mind? It is one of the most desperate, desperate Zionist ploys that we hear more often these days, which is this idea that there was never a Palestinian state. Therefore, therefore, what's going on is in some way justified. Now, uh, the this argument, first of all, above all, it depends on the idea of the nation state, this 19th century invention as having been the gold standard by which people have the right to live on the land that they live on. It also assumes that there were that the uh, the uh, Hebrew lands of the Old Testament somehow were this nation state. But but we hear this argument over and over again, and we need to point out when we hear this, the absurdity of the argument, even on the uh, the historical scale and much less on the on the moral scale as though this had any bearing. Now, so we get to, uh, as Tony spoke much about the the Balfour Declaration, I think given the way that we today are being silenced with with the the reverse definition of anti-Semitism, I think it's important to start from the beginning and point out how anti-Semitism was exploited by the Zionists during the Balfour Declaration era. Um, there was a, I'd like to read a couple of extracts from a an Italian Jew who lived in Alexandria, who was influential on the minds of the Brits who were uh, working with the the um, British Zionists to, to write the Balfour Declaration. There was this idea that 1916 or so, the British were not doing so well in the Great War, World War I. So the, the Zionists decided that they would exploit this this. British anti-Semitic idea of Jews as some great worldwide cabal that had this great power. So I will read to you a letter from Sir Edward Gray, uh, December, uh, who was the foreign secretary at the time before Balfour. It was clear that England had not in the present struggle, World War I, the sympathy of the Jewish race and he feared that the indifference or hostility of the Jewish race had been a dead weight against us during the past 18 months of the war and would continue to retard every step we took towards victory. And went on to, to talk about how this, this, this Alexandrian Jew, whose name was Suarez, no relation, it's spelled differently, told him, in effect, all you have to do is sign on the line, all the Jews, this race, in the most anti-Semitic terminology, all you need to do was to give us Palestine and we will enlist our forces to help you win the war. Now, it's hard to reconstruct today how much the British actually believed this or that they used this also as a reason because they thought that the... Um, the uh, the Zionists could, in effect, be the caretakers for their acquisition of Palestine in the future. But uh, if you fast forward twenty years past the the Balfour Declaration to the Peel Commission, which was formed to uh, try to figure out how to sort out the catastrophe that had already evolved from the Balfour Declaration, down the line. Winston Churchill and all the other people who had had some part in in the affairs of the time, they all said the same thing, that the reason they, they quote unquote, gave Palestine to the Zionists was because they had made this deal with, as they put it, the Jews. So again, whether to whether to believe that this was really the reason or a reason that they used, the fact is that they were affected by the Zionist use of anti-Semitic ideas at the time. So you you come now to the Zionists beginning to occupy Palestine, and it's important to point out that although other places were considered, 
uh, Uganda, Cyprus, the Sinai, these places were considered, they were, they were never alternatives to Palestine. They were always stepping stones to Palestine if Palestine could not be gotten immediately. Now, the reason this is important is because once we get to the point where the Zionists have achieved some sort of political perceived legitimacy through the European support, the, then we confront Zionism as a marketing project, a huge marketing project through to this day. Now, it had to be Palestine. Why? Because they were selling a messianic product. And where, where could the idea of the Jews so-called going back to their biblical roots? Obviously, it had to be Palestine. And it had nothing to do with religion. Ben-Gurion himself states that the, um, th they had to call the land, they had to call it either Israel or, funny enough, he also said it could be called Judea. Why? Because they, that was the only way, in his words, that they could get enough Jews to, to go there. It was a marketing project. And the use of Hebrew as the vernacular was also for the same reason. You couldn't have this theater of the um, of uh, or this this reconstitution of the Hebrew lands and people speaking German or Ladino or Polish or Arabic or whatever. No, it had to be Hebrew, and this is why Hebrew was enforced by violence. There were actually uh, many programs against some of the settlers who. They were they had gone to Palestine because that was the place to go to get away from the uh, the the fascism in Europe. But they weren't particularly interested in this theater of the um, uh, of the Zionists, and they were they were beat up. Their uh, their presses were blown up for for speaking and writing in German. Now. When we get to the end of the of the mandate period, during which obviously uh, the the Palestinians, after two major uprisings, had decided, okay, they decided that that the uprisings did not do any good. Let's see what happens if we do exactly what we're well, I don't mean to put what we're told, but that if we don't rebel and if instead we go along with it and that we should be rewarded for playing by the rules. So you have a period from uh, the roughly the beginning of World War II through to the early summer of 1947, whereby there, there was constant, constant violence against the Palestinians, which we we don't have recorded in the same detail that we have recorded violence against the the British by the by the Zionists or against Jews by the Zionists. And by the way, the the principal victim of Zionist assassination, which is to say targeted killing rather than just victims of bombings, were Jews, not the British, not the Palestinians. The Palestinians were victims of of obviously of market bombings and this sort of thing. But we we know of just general terrorism against the Palestinians through British records, which simply state that it's still going on. They didn't bother to record it in the same detail they did it against, against the British, but it's always mentioned in passing, oh yes, a few more Palestinians were knifed on the Tel Aviv beach by the Zionists and on. There were, for that several year period, there was virtually no Palestinian blowback against this. And they even say that, that the British even point out that they are not, in so many words, taking the bait. That they know that if they, if they fight back, that this would be used as an excuse by the Zionists to justify their actions. Fast forward today, and you, it's an exact explanation of what's happening. 
every time the Palestinians defend themselves, it is turned around as a reason for the, the, uh, for the Israeli state to attack. Now, we get to the end of the, of the mandate period, and the other thing that we hear constantly today is that the Palestinians declined the offer of a state. Uh, the Netanyahu has been saying that, and uh, Alan Dershowitz said it uh, just on an interview a few days ago, this idea that somehow this justifies what's going on today because Resolution 181, we are told, offered both the the Zionists and the Palestinians a state. The Zionists accepted it with gratitude and the Palestinians scoffed at it. Now, this above and beyond everything else should be exposed as an, as an immoral explanation for what is happening today. But okay, let's, if, if this is going to be used as a reason, let's look at what actually happened, which is that the Zionists refuted Resolution 181 even more strongly than the Palestinians did, but they played a chess game. If you look through all the records of Zionist meetings from the, the um, immediate post, post Balfour period all the way up to 1947, without fail, the Zionists planned from the beginning to take over the entire area and that it must be cleaned of as many non-Jews as possible. There is no exception to this except for some nice words spoken in public for public consum consumption. And it is explicit all the way from so-called moderates like Heim Weizmann, who would become the first president, to, to mainstream figures that were supposed to be a bit more radical, like David Ben-Gurion. This was constant, that they would accept nothing less than at least river to sea, and hopefully more than that, cleansed of non-Jews. So, it was clear by the time of the Peel Commission, 1937, it was pretty clear, even though the idea of partition that was proposed by the commission was never, was never followed up, it was pretty clear that ultimately what would happen is the land would be partitioned. And this was known to be the case by the Zionists by about 1944, the British were discussing that this was going to be their exit out of the catastrophe they had created. It was going to be a, a partition scam. And I say scam because it was known by the British. And shortly after that, when the, after the, um, the uh, death of FDR in 1945, shortly before the end of the Second World War, that uh, when the Americans became more hands-on uh, 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 complicit with the Zionists, it was assumed that it was going to be partitioned, but it was also known that the Zionists would never abide by partition. And the whole thing was a scam. Now, the reason that the Zionists wanted partition is because it gave them statehood, and statehood was the key to everything. Even as early as uh, years before that, when uh, Weizmann met with Benito Mussolini, Weizmann actually already then referred to partition as the Archimedean fulcrum, the, the idea that if you put the fulcrum on the, in the right place of the lever, you could lift anything. So with statehood, they could achieve everything else. Now, there was a reason why the uh, UNSCUP, the UN committee that was tasked with finding a solution to the problem by the late 1940s, the reason why they selected partition as opposed to a binational single state, which was another idea they had. The reason they chose partition in the words of the British in documents not public at the time, was because they knew that if they had selected a single state, that this, there would be an increase in what they called Jewish terrorism that they would not be able to control, which of course was a reference to the Zionist terrorism that had already brought Palestine to, to its knees, and that 100,000 
British soldiers had been unable to control. So that is the fear of Zionist terrorism, which at the time was increase, increasingly threatening not just Palestine, but also Europe and Britain, their fear of that was why they selected partition. And they knew that the Zionists wanted partition because it gave them the prize of statehood. Now, interestingly, once they selected partition as the answer, they had to draw the line. So it's curious that although the settlers were still a minority, that partition, Resolution 181, gave the Zionists about 55% of, of the land. Now, why did they do that? The reason they did that proves that the UN and everybody involved, the, the British and principally in, and the United States, knew as a fact beforehand that the Zionists were going to disregard partition anyway. And the proof of that is, again, in British records, why they drew the line the way they did. And the reason is because they knew that that the Zionists would ignore it, but they thought by that giving them so much in front that they would delay, not, not prevent, but delay the first Zionist war of expansion. Now, above all, the Palestinians knew this. They weren't stupid. They knew what was going to happen. And this is why they refused to go along with the scam. They, by the way, proposed, they counter-offered with a a plan which would be which would be based on the the system of the United States, a constitutional system, which obviously the Zionists were not interested in. Everything that happened ha has happened since then has been along the same lines. Uh, after the establishment of the Israeli state, you have the uh, the um, the 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 refugees in the West Bank and the people who were already living in what became the West Bank, then their lives also upended because of the, the upheaval and the, the refugees. And it's important at this point, especially considering what's going on, to always bring out the fact that the refugees are refugees, not for the, re the reasons that people who are unable to go home because of, of a natural disaster or, or ongoing conflict. No, the reason why there are millions of people who wake up every morning to the, to the squalor of refugee camps is because Israel blocks their return. It's not for any other reason. So it's important always to point out with the, the, the genocide going on in Gaza now to point out that most of the people in Gaza have homes. Those homes are now in, in the area under Israeli control. And the only reason they are not there is because Israel blocks them. Now, imagine the situation, imagine the situation today reversed, where some uh, Arab Arab tribes had, who lived elsewhere decided that the uh, that their holy book gave them the land of of Palestine, which at the time was populated by European Jews. Imagine everything reversed, and what would be going on today? The 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 if if any of us were barred from going to our homes tonight because some foreign country blocked us, this is simply a continuation of what happened in 1948. And I think must always be brought out today because of what is happening. Brilliant. Thank you both very much. Fantastic introductions, uh, really important introductions that explain what's going on and why the situation is so important. Comrades, if you have um, an understanding is so important of, of the history, if you have any questions or contributions, please click raise hand and I can bring you in. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you um, both to get the ball rolling. First to, to you, Tom, when you listen to Tony, do you agree with his assessment that the control of the Suez Canal was really of utmost importance and explains why Britain was so keen on, on having an outpost there, if, if you want to call it that? 
Is that the Suez Canal mainly in your estimation? I think the Suez Canal, yes, was certainly part of this. Um, and and it, it certainly then ultimately played into the, uh, the Suez crisis was the uh, control of that area. Uh, Tony knows more about that than I do. But yes, I, I certainly agree that that was part of it. And then a question to you both. I mean, without Britain, I mean, and you described, you know, not just the mandate period or the Balfour Declaration, et cetera, against opposition as well. Without Britain uh, and its empire at the time and its strategic um, interests, et cetera, would there be an Israel? Would, would another country have pushed quite so hard without Britain doing it? That brings up the whole question, which I have never been able to answer, and I've never heard a convincing answer, as to why the degree of Western, and especially my native country, the United States, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, the, the degree of fealty to Israel, one can understand, of course, there's the uh, pied de terre in the Middle East, there's the arms industry, there's maybe uh, oil, even though there's no oil in Israel proper, but but uh, control of the area. You add all these things up, you add up the uh, all the Christian Zionists, the United States, and uh, you add in APAC, all this stuff, to me, it still falls short of explaining why we are so beholden to this this thing over there. I can't explain it, but uh, but certainly the uh, the um, interest in the area uh, is playing out in strange ways today. Uh, Tony, what do you think? Sorry, I wasn't following. Uh, tell me again. What was the main question? Uh, what uh, looking at the world today? Why is the United States uh, okay? Germany is it looks like Germany is, is a special case because they are supposed to uh, somehow redress their history of racial nationalism, which they're doing by supporting someone else's racial nationalism. Explain that one, uh, but. But why the extent where, forgetting the German case, where the United States is destroying itself, it's it's uh, selling its whatever moral soul it once had, it has sold. It's it's selling itself financially. Uh, in it's making a complete farce of its of its alleged narrative for the sake of this this Israeli state. Why? Well, I, I think the reason is, firstly, the human rights narrative of the United States, the fight for democracy and so on and so on, has, all, has always been paper thin. I mean, we only yes. have, to, have to look back to Pinochet, the Argentinian junta, the invasion of Iraq. I mean, the Indonesian slaughter. I mean, it's always been a fiction, but... Today, it's even more of a fiction. Uh, I, the reason is that foreign policy is conducted on the basis of uh, interests, economic primarily and political. And Israel, I mean, as Alexander Haig, uh, Reagan's Secretary of State said, is cheap at the price. It's a stable settler state in a region where there is a lot of instability and turmoil. And, you know, I mean, if you employ an attack dog, you don't want to kick it too much because otherwise it may it may rebound. So, I mean, Israel has to be supported, come what may, whatever it does. I mean, you know, and I sometimes ask myself, is there anything that Israel could do that the United States would disown? And I'm not sure there is an answer short of killing all the firstborn Palestinians. Uh, and even then, they'd probably say, well, they should be grateful not that, that it was only the firstborn. So uh, I'm really not sure that uh, the United States could ever live up to its rhetoric because Israel is a part of its presence. It's the Suez Canal, 
it's the oil interest, but also the geopolitical interests in that area demand that if Israel goes, because Israel has successfully intimidated the Arab regimes into coming to terms with it. Uh, and of course, it protects them against their own people if it comes to that. It, Israel is important to the Jordanian king when the ref be on the throne now, but for Israel, for example. Uh, I mean, Netanyahu virtually wept tears when Hosni Mubarak in Egypt was overthrown. Uh, so I, I, I don't think there's anything too surprising about the United States position. Uh, it, today. It, seems to, it seems to me, okay, we're going to, we're going to buy our access over there. Okay. What's the price? Uh, how much is it going to cost? It, and I don't just mean financially, but in uh, it, all the things that we sacrifice for this, this state, it seems to me that we could get everything that you're saying we want from Israel for a much better price. It seems that there seems to be no end to this. But and that... much of the, the turmoil that you refer to is a result of our propping up this, this state over there. Well, I'm not sure that's true, because imagine there was no Israel. So there was no enemy to focus on. And remember that Palestine is a symbol for revolt in all of the Arab East. It, it represents, if you like, the... I say the symbol of colonial penetration uh, in the Arab East and what's been done to the Arab peoples. Remove Israel and the Arab regimes have to face their own people much more directly. Uh, and I, I think that is one reason. But, you know, imperialism is not logical. If you did a cost benefit analysis, you may be right. But we know that a never increasing proportion of the US budget is spent on its military. Logically, that makes no sense, but that's what they do. And of course, that means the arms companies profit and they are important politically. So supporting Israel means you increase and ramp up your arms expenditure. I, I mean, I all still, sorts of benefits for imperialism. I still don't see that as if you take something like uh, like the crime of the U.S. Uh, uh, overthrow in, in Chile and the installation of Pinochet. Okay, now this was a crime, but it was it was done, and then the rest was the fallout from it. Or even the Iraq War. Once you invaded, then you have then you own the the war. To me, Israel is different. Is because it's ongoing, and there is no end to it. it for example, take the the genocide in Gaza now. I don't see that we have any benefit by uh, the United States uh, uh, interests get any benefit out of more genocide rather than less genocide. No, no there is no benefit. I mean, I, I'm sure Joe Biden would be much happier if there was no genocide. But but it's in his hands. Well, it's yes, it's in his hands. But given the choice between dissociating himself from Israel or uh, opposing, uh, have I got it the right way around? Given the choice between dissociating himself from the genocide or supporting Israel, then he supports Israel, come what may, and not just Biden. I mean, the whole of the Republican Party and virtually all the Democrats. I mean, it is, it is a wall-to-wall -wall coalition of the American ruling class with very, very few exceptions. And so how do we explain the, I mean, the main lobby in favour of uh, Israel and Zionism in the US is not a Jewish lobby, as some people imagine. It's right. a Christian, uh, and the Christian Zionists really are just a religious representation of US imperialism. I mean, they justify everything, wherever it is, in terms of God, because God is always on our side. Why do they do it in Israel? because it's an incredibly important region to have a stable settler state, which all but finances itself, mm -hmm. which is a hammer, in essence, a revolution anywhere in that region. I think it's cheap at the price, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 the, only, the only way Israel is going to be threatened in terms of the US relationship is if the Arab regimes themselves are threatened. In other words, revolution in the Arab East is as important 
as what happens in Palestine eventually if we want to see an end to Zionism. We have a few comrades now with their hands up, because I think it's also important to understand that, of course, Britain had other interests uh, in, in 1917 when it issued the Bill of Balfour Declaration in Israel than are now uh, America has. But it's it's important to understand where, where that history comes from. Uh, Tom, did you want to say something before I bring in some some people with some questions? Uh, no, uh, just I. I'm still not convinced that there's there's something else going on. I'm still not convinced that you add all this up and it explains the bizarre behavior of the United States. I don't think it's bizarre. I mean, no. I think it's of a piece with everything else. That, that's the difference. I should add that at the time of the Balfour Declaration, for many years to come, certainly the better part of a decade, British, the British ruling class was divided over the wisdom of the Zionist enterprise. The Daily Mail and Daily Express were opposed. I think the House of Lords actually passed a motion opposing the battle for declaration at one point. Yeah, so there was a long debate. And actually, the military were less in favour of the battle for declaration, and the political wing, Churchill in particular, were in favour. So there was that debate had out within the British ruling class before eventually they settled on Zionism as their established. Why did they oppose it, Tony? Oh, we're wasting more money on uh, on these Jewish settlers. Why are we throwing good money after bad? Because they always weighed up the costs of empire. Uh, they didn't see the benefits would be long-term, whereas Churchill was far more far-sighted in that respect, although George was as well. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, Ian, would you like to come in and ask a question or make a comment? Uh, really just to ask a question. Um, given that Britain had played a, a huge role in effectively training uh, and arming the Haganah, uh, and indeed the Urgun, I suppose, uh, one removed, um, I, I was reading in Ilan Pape's book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine Today, that the Soviet Union also provided uh, armaments uh, for Zionist settlers in 1947-48. Um, could you explain a little bit around that? Uh, and uh, although I think I know the answer to this one, could you again um, bring out a little bit of the... the, the... But after all, um, the Nakba happened on Labour's watch. This tension seems to have existed in, in the Labour Party uh, to, to ensure uh, the Zionist settlement went ahead. Thank you. The um, Labour, by the way, uh, Labour Party actually proposed the transfer of non-Jews out of Palestine on behalf of the Zionists. Uh, and, and yes, the Zionists, there was a major purchase of Russian arms. Uh -huh. I believe it was by way of Czechoslovakia uh, in 47, aside from a lot of... Free pa uh, Palestine, free Palestine, bro. Shut oh, up, bro. Sorry. Communism is the way, bro. Okay, sorry, somebody. Um, sorry, Corey, it's carry on, Tom. I don't know. If uh, aside from many shipments from uh, Britain and especially the United States, illegal shipments uh, secretly going over to the to the Zionists, and of course, w one of the reasons why we decided to get rid of Nasser was because he, in frustration, went also to uh, to Russia to get arms and where it was okay for the Zionists to do it, it was not okay for the Egyptians to do it. Tony, do you have anything to, to... Well, Stalin's foreign policy was always very short-sighted and counterproductive. And of course he prioritized the interests of the Soviet Union, socialism in one country over revolution outside. I mean, that was the main thrust uh, and it was a, a usually a reactionary policy. And Stalin's calculation was that supporting the Zionists would get rid of British imperialism from the Middle East, not realising, of course, that American imperialism was ready and set to take its place. Uh, and of course, after Suez, uh, Eisenhower put the British in their place and the French too, uh, when in essence he caused a run on the pound uh, and Britain had to very quickly uh, withdraw. Uh, so that was a narrow calculation. In fact, it could be argued that without the Czechoslovak arms and the air 
the aeroplanes and so on they supplied them, the Zionists might not have won the battle. So, I mean, it was incredibly important and incredibly stupid. And what it did was undermine the support for the communist parties, which were strong in places like Iraq and Egypt and Syria. So, you know, but then again, I mean, Stalin didn't care because he didn't care about revolution anywhere else either. So that was the Soviet Union's calculation. Uh, the, the Zionist calculation, of course, was, uh, was a mirror image of that. They wanted to replace British imperialism uh, and switch sides uh, to the American imperialism. The Biltmore Co Conference in 1942 was, uh, if you like, where that decision was effectively taken. Uh, and that was the result reason for the dispute between Chaim Weizmann and Ben-Gurion, because, I mean, Weizmann actually left the presidency for three years, I think, of the Zionist organisation as a result of the bitter disputes between those two Zionist leaders. Hmm. Was that your, answer, uh, your question answered, Ian? Yes, thank you. Thank you. OK, Malcolm, I think you want to just ask a question or not come in. Uh, and... I, uh, I, I, um, first of all, I, um, people should read the books written by both our speakers. They're both incredibly informative. But one of the one of the things I'd like to ask, which is outlined in their books over and over again, is how how the sort of ruthless violence of Zionism is is not well known. I mean, why is it it's sort of in I sort of, I call it popular press, but I mean people don't I mean it's pointed out by by both Tony and Tom in their books have the similarities between Zionism and, and the Nazis. But I mean, that's, that's not a narrative, is it, in, 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 in the media at all, as far as I know. Thank you. Well, that's one of the reasons that uh, the IHRA uh, pseudo definition specifically forbids the analogy between uh, Nazism and Zionism, because that's that uh, would be obviously a uh, fatal flaw for, for Zionism. I have to say that I've always resisted the uh, the comparison, not because there are not valid points to it, but because it seems to me that we shouldn't need to invoke European suffering in order to explain non-European suffering, that we should look at what's happening to the Palestinians and it in and of itself should should show us what's happening. We shouldn't need to compare it to uh, to Russian to uh, I'm sorry to European uh, uh, suffering, but uh, certainly with what's going on today, I think the comparison should be invoked uh, to because we need to to wake up the public of the one country. Uh, that that can stop this, the United States, and um, why the history of Zionist terrorism during the uh, the uh, pre-state years and, of course, after statehood, the same thing, is is not better known because there's for the same reason that uh, if you go to the New York Times or slightly less egregious the BBC World News, you get. Uh, a, a sanitized version of what's happening. But uh, one of the, to me, one of the principal reasons why the Zionists fought so bitterly to prevent a, a Palestinian state, it wasn't just land. It was also because uh, statehood has its own privileged language. Once, once the Israeli state self-declared itself, it's what had been its terrorism now became the actions of a sovereign state. It became they became military actions. Uh, we think of Dar Yusin as a, this great act of terrorism, which it was. But there were there were uh, atrocities after that, which were even worse. But we don't think of them the same way because it was done by a state, and for the same reason. A, a Palestinian resistance is now called a terrorism simply because they do not speak from the podium of, of statehood. Tony, do you want to say something? 
Well, yeah, I mean, the simple answer is that imperialism never concentrates on its own violence. Uh, you know, I mean, we watched Westerns when I was younger and you never saw the, the Indians being exterminated. What you saw was the Indians attacking for no re good reason at all. The cowboys who circled their wagons. Uh, the same in India, the Black Hole of Calcutta was remembered, but not blowing Indians from the cannons of uh, British guns. Uh, the same with Israel. I mean, although they can't prevent the violence being shown, you'll see in the statements of politicians, they prioritise the attack on October the 7th uh, and not the violence that the Israeli state has pursued since then. And of course, there's no mention at all of the violence against Gaza before October the 7th, which puts it into context. So that is how imperialism operates. It is very, very selective in what it shows. Uh, and that's the very nature. It's rooted in imperialism, that imperialism doesn't consider its own violence to be anything to worry about. I mean, America's invasion of Iraq, did we see all the all, all the many, many atrocities that the Americans committed? Of course not. Uh, and Julian Assange is paying the price because he did expose some of them. So it, I think this is just how it operates. Of course, Israel is having a problem uh, with the violence it uh, is perpetrating, which is why it's doing its best either to exclude journalists from Gaza or to kill them while they're there uh, so they can't report. Uh, a couple of points. Firstly, a good book to read, although it's dated, it's still, I think, quite valid, is Leonard Steen's The Balfour Declaration. Uh, it is very, very thorough, and I, I do recommend people to it. As regards the Nazis, I mean, I, I think comparisons are valid. Uh, obviously, the comparisons aren't particularly apposite after 1941, when the uh, Holocaust uh, began. But it is worth bearing in mind that in Israel today, there is an exterminationist mentality towards the Palestinians. And many people actually do talk of that openly. So the mindset of the Nazis is certainly present in Zionism. And they are quite similar projects in uh, certain ways. They're both were ethno-nationalist states, for example. And we know the Nazis turned to the Holocaust when expulsion was no longer possible of the Jews. Uh, and what we're seeing today is the precursor of much the same phenomena uh, in Gaza. Uh, I don't think we should be under any doubt that uh, uh, however many are killed, it's not enough for major elements of Zionists, represented by people like Ben Gavir and Smotrich mm -hmm. in the Israeli cabinet, who openly talk about killing thousands. So, I mean, and of course, we, I mean, we should say, I mean, the, the, the Israel, the Israeli state has is not, you know, set up gas chambers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to kill Palestinians. But no, it, there's a, there's... the Holocaust, doesn't it? It uses the Holocaust as an excuse to commit its own genocide, and that's why I think actually any comparisons are should be allowed because if, if you misuse that tragedy to create your own genocide on people, you know, then you have to. Be able to this is uh, a, another aspect where I think history can help us now, and this is something that uh, Tony specializes on, is the, the fact that during the darkest days of European Jewry, Zionism was not their friends. No, Zionism worked against the, um, the safety, salvation, dignity of, of European Jews when they most needed it. So it, it's it's truly it's grotesquely ironic now that that the Zionists always invoke the uh, history of European anti-Semitism and the Holocaust as the, that they are the torchbearer of the moral weight of this. When no, it was the opposite. And, and uh, of course, Tony's book should be read for uh, for anyone interested in that subject. I, I did put both titles of your books in, in the emails advertising this, but I should oh, say right. the thing as well. So Thomas has uh, written a book called Palestine Hijacked, How Zionism Forged an Apartheid State from River to Sea, amongst other things you've written. And Tony Greenstein book is called a Zionism During the Holocaust. Um, we have a, now a question from a 10-year-old viewer. Very, <laughs> uh, very much looking forward to that one. Hello, comrade. <laughs> 
Hello. Hi. Right. Um, so recently there's been some bombing in Palestine and Israel by both sides. Um, just wondering about the... So there's been quite a few deaths. A lot of deaths. Yeah. Um, and... What is, this, what is this situation? What yeah. is going to happen? What's going to happen now with it all? That's wow. a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Tom, do you want to start? <laughs> Thank you, Tony, and I hope you're okay, Tony. I hope you and he, he can give you his pocket money if you need some money. No, no, no. I mean, it, 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 that's okay. And thank you for your well wishes, and thank you for everyone. I mean, these these are difficult times where freedom of speech is under attack by the mm -hmm. state, so uh, we have to bear that in mind. Uh, thank you. I, I don't know your name. Yeah, uh, Augustus. 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 Oh, right. That's a famous Roman emperor. Emperor, I yeah. believe. Uh, what is going to happen? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, that's the first thing. So, and I'm not that good at predicting the future, unlike Nostradamus. But <laughs> having said that, uh, I know what the Israeli, the, the Zionist movement, the Israeli government, uh, and the majority of the Israeli people, the Israeli Jewish people, want, and that is to ethnically cleanse Gaza of the Palestinians to empty it and to pour them into Egypt and create a further refugee problem. Whether they get away with that, I do not know, but that is the meaning of a food and water and fuel blockade. It, it is to drive them out of Gaza. Mm. Yeah. Tom, how do you think uh, the situation is going to develop? And I mean, the Biden, both Biden and the EU are now talking about sustainable ceasefires, et cetera. Mm. Is that and coming anytime soon, you think? Um, I, of course, agree with Tony that what Israel wants is to use this as an excuse to ethnically cleanse the people in Gaza into the Sinai and then uh, annex Gaza. Now, it's hard to imagine them getting away with that, but of course, we've said that before when when we're proven wrong and they do get away with with. Uh, what we thought was impossible. But I do think that because of the significant blowback around the world, that they won't get away with that this time. The question then becomes, who will govern Gaza? The Israelis are, of course, adamant that, certainly not Hamas, but not even uh, Fatah in the, in the West Bank will, will govern which is a bit odd to me because uh, Fatah is really just a, a Vichy is a government for Israel at this point. But um, the they will also be against any UN supervision of the Gaza Strip. So uh, I don't know how it's going to play out. Uh, or uh, I'm sorry, Augustus, is that the name? Augustus. Yeah. Uh, what What do you think? What do you think? Well, I think that hopefully it should clear up and everyone should um, get back to their daily lives and everyone get back and live happily with their <laughs> families. And why do you think that doesn't happen? Mainly because, um, greedy. yeah, greed and wealth. I see. People... Um, salvage money and try and get as much as possible let's say um for example uh coca-cola all these brands are uh, really add, yeah adding money to against palestine okay he's my grandson you realize i'm a good <laughs> very good thanks augustus thank you the youngest person yeah. i've had on the program so thank you for thank you for that <laughs> Um, Peter, Peter Kahn, please. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, a while ago, I went on a visit to Belfast, um, visited the uh, Catholic streets, uh, familiar to many of us, uh, but also to the Protestant streets, and I came across some, a mural dedicated to Colonel Patterson. Um, and I'd never heard of him. 
but he explained in the, on this mural about how he had basically create, helped to create a Jewish unit within the British Army uh, and was later uh, described as the father of the Israeli army and became friends of the Netanyahu family um, and was a big influence, um, well, it seems to be an influence on American thinking as well as British ruling class thinking. Um, I'm surprised that in all the discussions and debates I've heard over recently, his name has never been mentioned. I just wonder whether Tony and Tom could shed some light on him. Thank was, you. was he in, involved in the formation of the Jewish Brigade in 1944 or something? I'm trying to figure out what this was that he was involved with. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, it would have been First World War and just after. Oh, so First he, World War. OK, there were two. There was a during the First World War, there was an attempt at this. It was the Jewish called the Jewish <laughs> Legion. Uh, which never quite got off the ground. But then towards the end of the Second World War, uh, the Zionists were working towards a an exclusively Jewish unit, which became the Jewish Brigade, against the wishes of the and, and the advice of the military people. It was a political decision. Uh, that's again, I do you do you have a better idea of the year involved with this? Sorry, is sorry, you're muted. Tony, do you know anything about more about this? Um, okay. Can I speak? Yes, you can. Okay. Speak. Uh, yeah, I don't have a detailed history, but um, I, I know he, he was a, an officer in the First World War and helped to establish this unit. And in the post war <laughs> period, uh, he was uh, influential in, in uh, arming uh, Zionists. Um, I mean, I, I find it interest, uh, interesting that we talk about the Balfour Declaration and the machinations of the, within the ruling class, British ruling class, but at the same time, there are people with guns that are arming the Zionists. So it wasn't just pieces of paper, it was violence. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I, I've never heard of this Colonel Patterson, uh, I have to confess. Uh, there was another Colonel, uh, I think it, that was his rank, uh, Minor Hartsgen in the First World War, who certainly was influential. I suspect that someone, uh, I presume it must have been in the Shankill Road, not the, uh, not the Falls Road, uh, has dug out a bit of history, whether he was as influential as is made out. Uh, I have my doubts. The most influential pro-Zionist British officer, and the British Army initially was pretty hostile to the Zionist enterprise. They thought it would get in their way, was uh, Major Lord Wingate, who died in Burma, I think in 1944 with the Chindits. Uh, he was a Christian Zionist. He trained them in the counterinsurgency in the, between 1936 and 39. Uh, with the Palmach, who became, in essence, the, the, the equivalent of the SAS. They were the left of the Kibbutzin movement, incidentally. So people, when we use left and right in, uh, for Zionism, these are very different terms from the ones we ourselves should understand. The left was the most militaristic in many ways. So it, you need to bear that in mind. But unfortunately, about this Patterson guy, uh, I'll do a Google search after the program, but uh, I, I know nothing about him. I'm sorry. Jane, please. It's actually Toby Absey, but he's using my um, Zoom link. Okay. I switch it round. Hope you will see. Okay. Okay. Um, to some extent, uh, what I was going to say was raised by Ian uh, earlier, and uh, Tony actually agreed uh, that the a role of the, I was, it was the role of the Soviet Union um, and the the arms that had came via Czechoslovakia, which played the biggest role I thought in the forty eight war, and I think Tony is agreeing with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, um. That therefore I was what I was seeking to do was well, whilst I'm not 
in any way disagreeing with the notion that from 1967 onwards, that there was this intensely close link between American imperialism and the state of Israel. And I was also aware that in the 50s, it was French imperialism that was the sponsor of the state of Israel, which leads up to Suez more than the Brits. Um, all, all I was doing was uh, seeking to do was to question the, the the notion that British imperialism had consistently supported the Zionists. Yeah, I mean, it did off and on, but I would have thought in, in 48, um, Glub Pasha, for example, uh, and there were other people who were British with the Arab armies uh, in 48, and the, um, as uh, Tony said, it was um, the USSR which was backing um, the Zionists and arming them via Czechoslovakia. So it, it, I was just commenting a bit on the what I felt was a slight oversimplification um, there. And I suppose, I don't want to sound that I'm justifying Stalin too much, but, um, you know, the, the Arab regimes of the time were pretty reactionary. Uh, we're talking about a period before people like Nasser, uh, and um, they were under the influence of British imperialism. And I, I would have, therefore, would give critical support in a way to what Stalin was doing. I'm not justifying the Nakba, I'm not justifying De Yassin or anything like that. But I mean, um, there's also the question of the Brits were actually stopping um, Jews going to Palestine around that time. They were also stopping them going to, to Britain as well, while they were uh, quite willing to admit every Ukrainian and Latvian war criminal they could to Britain in the between 45 and 48, when they were keeping Jews out of both Britain. I mean, I'm talking about the people in the deep, um, you know, the displaced people, um, the, the people, survivors of the Holocaust who were in mainland Europe were being kept out of Britain at that point. Um, so the British attitude is a bit more um, ambivalent than, than I think um, some of the things earlier were saying. Look, I, I'm not disputing what you're talking about, either of you talking about now. I mean, there is a Palestinian child being killed every 10 minutes because of the American arms that are going to the Israelis and have been going to the Israelis for 75 days. And I think this is typical of US foreign policy. It's not just to do with Israel. If you think of the seas of blood in Indonesia in 65, um, and if you think of the hundreds of thousands who died in Iraq uh, and what they did in, in Afghanistan and all the rest of it, which Assange, you know, is is probably going to be put in life confinement in the U.S. for having dared reveal that. I mean, the U.S. policy is pretty murderous. Uh, I mean, I do think they're the worst of the imperialist powers. Uh, uh, their, their record all over the place is terrible. I could go on about Italy and all the things they did backing a neo-fascist terrorism consistently, but I, I'll shut I'll shut up there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Tom, what do you want me to? Go on. Yes, I mean, there was a time, look, in all settler states, you find that at a certain period of time, the settlers rebel against the mother country or the sponsoring power. That happened in South Africa. There were two Boer Wars, don't forget. But despite that, after the Boer Wars, Britain, in essence, supported apartheid under first Smuts uh, and then, uh, of course, Milan. Uh, the same in Palestine. There were conflicts with the British. I mean, the main conflict was from 1945 onwards, when the Haganah and the Agun were fighting to evict the British. There's no doubt about it. It was a war uh, between them. But nonetheless... Britain knew that it could not arm or support the Palestinians. And so, if you like, it retreated rather than conduct that fight, given the pressure it was under from America. But what, what can one say? Of course, you're right about America. I mean, uh, I've said it myself, that uh, the United States will spout, spill any amount of blood. But even it, 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 during the Labour government, which was if you like, Bevan was pretty hostile. 
uh, to uh, the Zionist enterprise as a result. Uh, but there were important figures within the Labour Party and the Labour government and the Labour Parliamentary Party, Richard Crossman, Lasky, and so on, who basically supported the Zionist terrorists. Uh, they had no uh, compunction in doing so. Uh, so much for patriotism. And Israel itself, although Stalin believed that he could evict the British, at no point did the Israeli government therefore support Stalinism. Ben-Gurion was a fervent anti-communist. Indeed, the reason in the 1949, the first elections to the Knesset, Powell's uh, Mapai gained 46 seats out of 120. Mapam gained 19 with what was called Ahdut Abada. Together, they had an overall majority in the Knesset. But because Mapam was pro-Soviet at that time, Ben-Gurion preferred to form an alliance with the general Zionists and what became the National Religious Party. So from its very outset, Israel was anti-communist. Uh, the Labour Zionists were uh, prime amongst them. Mapam at that time was more pro-Soviet, though it, it later also followed an anti-communist path. Interesting. Do you have anything else on that, Tom? No, no, nothing to add to that. Thank you. We've got a few uh, people now. Um, comments, if you could ask your, keep your comments or contributions quite short. Thank you. Um, Satish. Hiya. Sorry, you need to unmute. Can you see it? I'll bring somebody else quickly in and then see if you can if you can find it. Yeah. Um Cheryl, please. Oh, oh okay. there he is. Oh, you got it? Have you got it, Satish? Yes, I, I okay. Got yeah, go on then. Yeah. But Cheryl <laughs> can go first if you if you want. No, to. no, it's all right. Sorry, you you go ahead now. Well, my question was in, in relation to the Ottoman Empire, in that uh, I'd like to know what you both think about during the early days, well, I say early days, more, more towards the end of the Ottoman Empire, how important was that, uh, or what they tried to do in terms of supporting the development of uh, Palestinian resistance and Arab resistance, and now that... Uh, the Ottoman Empire is obviously consigned to history. How important is Turkey in this struggle? I suggest I take another one question and then we can answer that together, if that's okay. Um, uh, Cheryl now, if you would like to come. Cheryl? Yep. yep there you are. We can't see Sorry. you. There you are. Sorry about that. Um, in relation to the point Tom was making earlier about American imperialism, I was on a Twitter space the other day with this uh, lady called Layla Hatoum. I'll post her name in the chat box. Um, who was a who was um, a Lebanese academic, and she has this. She gave a very interesting and very complicated. Um, answer to my question in relation to America's interest in in um, you know supporting the Israelis um, the it's I'll, I'll put it in the chat anyway it's called the real reason behind the Levantine war um, yeah um, Oh, yeah. So my question, sorry, getting to my question. I thought, Tony, you were a bit harsh in saying that all Israelis have got an exterminist um, ideology. Is that not? I mean, I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure all Israelis are, are, are of that mindset. Um, but my question is really about the origins of Zionism and um, how Israel is today, because it kind of presents itself as being a democracy. And if you listen, I, I listened to this um, short video by Gideon Levy, who was saying, well, you know, Israel has a veneer of democracy. Mm. However, you know, Arabs now can vote, um, you know, on 
on the face of it, they have equal rights. Um, and so in, in, in what way would you define it as an apartheid state? When I defined it the other day to a colleague of mine that it was an apartheid state, she, she was saying, well, no, no, it's not. I mean, Arabs can marry Jewish people, Arabs can vote in Israel. Oh. And I, I know there is, I know there is deep uh, racism. This is what Gideon Levy was saying, you know, it's the veneer of democracy, you know, there is deep racism against the Arabs. However, you know, the rule of law is equal, you know, they can stand in the Knesset and they can, you know, there is already a Palestinian Arab who is in the Knesset, etc. And I'm, so I suppose I'm saying, I know Tom was saying that, you know, that, that Palestinians can't go back, you know, you, you're saying they're blocked from going back. I assume you mean they're blocked from going back to land that was stolen from them. So I think, I suppose, and being a lawyer, I'm not an international lawyer, I'm kind of thinking, well, what, do, what does define apartheid? What, you know, uh, Arabs, I, for example, can can work in the labour market now, can't they? In in Israel, so what? Although maybe the origins were that the Arabs couldn't work. Um, is it? Yeah. If, so if could, anyway, I, if, yeah. For, first of all, if we ask what is what is the Israeli state now? You talk about people getting married. No, actually, by Israeli law in Israel. Uh, someone who the state considers to be Jewish cannot marry someone who the state considers not to be Jewish. There is this idea of a purity of blood. And as far as democracy goes, no, non-Jews within the Israeli state don't have the same rights. And if you extend that to East Jerusalem, which Israel considers to be as much a part of Israel as any other part, it claims to have annexed it, non-Jews non in East Jerusalem are not even citizens, they're residents. But the the larger question is, who whose lives does the Israeli state control? Not just the land that we consider to be Israeli, but it controls the lives of everybody in the West Bank. The, um, the Palestinian Authority is just a chimera, is just a, a shingle on a, on a door in Ramallah. It controls the lives of every refugee, everybody in a refugee camp, which uh, which I think that we do them a disservice to call them just refugee camps. Uh, all those people, their lives are directly controlled by Israel. They have no vote. The non-Jews in the West Bank have no vote. The people in Gaza, needless to say, have no vote. This is not a democracy, even by the most rudimentary definition of who can pull a lever. This whole idea of Israel as, as a democracy is so easy to debunk. It is nothing of the sort. And the... the uh, sorry, Tom, I wasn't referring to the West Bank or Gaza. I was actually referring... I was referring to 1948. I mean, they the, uh, Arabs do can have citizenship in, in Israel. But no, listen to what you're saying. Imagine if we if we started saying... The, no, in, I, I, in I the mean, West, legally... Well, black they, people they, can have citizenship. Imagine if we, if we spoke like this. No, I, I suppose I'm saying, you know, Britain is a, is, is a, is a very racist state where black people are, you know, there's institutional racism. And I'm saying, what defines it as an apartheid state? I mean, I heard, you know, recently that somebody had applied for citizenship because Netanyahu is so corrupt that it's, he could see ways that he could benefit from it. He was an Arab Palestinian. So I suppose I'm saying, league, you know, what is it? No, you, you I, are... I, 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 no, no, I'm... Let the answer now, Sharon. Yeah, Come on. sorry. I mean, do you want me to explain? If you're going to define apartheid, I think it's probably institutional, a state of institutionalized racial supremacy. Israel, there is one regime which controls the whole of Greater Israel, which is basically the existing mandate Palestine. It may have different administrative regimes within it, for the West Bank and for Gaza, but it controls the whole of Palestine. 
half the people have a vote, half the people don't have a vote. So even on Israel's own definition, it can't be democratic. In the West Bank, and of course Gaza by default, there are two legal regimes, one for Jewish settlers and another for non-Jewish Palestinians. That is the quintessential definition of apartheid. Inside Israel itself, there are about 60 laws which discriminate against Palestinians. Citizenship is not equal. Citizenship in Israel is virtually meaningless. Normally, you're a national of a country and therefore you're a citizen of that country. The two are coterminous. In Israel, that's not the case. There are about 130 nationalities, but being a Jewish state, there is only one nationality that is important, and that is Jewish nationality. So you look, for instance, at the behavior of the police who will operate according to the law. The, the police do not open fire ever on demonstrations of Jews, even when they turn violent, massive demonstrations against judicial reforms. The police didn't open fire. But for Palestinian and non-Jewish refugee demonstration recently by Eritreans, they have no hesitation in open fire and killing demonstrators. I mean, I'll give you one example of, of a discrimination. Uh, the Reception Committee's Law of 2011. There was a decision in the Supreme Court that the Jewish National Fund and the Israeli Land Authority could not refuse to sell someone a piece of property because they were not Jewish. That's what they were doing up to then. So what did the Israeli, uh, the Knesset do, and by a large majority, it passed a law which enabled the mission committees to refuse membership to people on social and cultural grounds. It didn't specify Arabs, but everyone understood what they meant. The law return, of course, which is the basic fundamental law of Israel, grants me the right to uh, go to Israel and claim citizenship and nationality, although I've only been there once and I have no desire to live there because I'm Jewish. But a Palestinian friend of mine cannot do that even if they're born there and there are, the whole idea of a jewish ethnic state is that it is inherently racist it cannot be anything other the difference with say britain where, which is nominally a christian state is it's not a christian ethno state where there were ethnic christian states in europe in the 1930s and 40s romania slovakia croatia hungary and so on. They were the most avid pursuers of the Holocaust of any states. In, in many ways, they outdid the Nazis. I mean, the governor Hans Frank, the Nazi governor of Poland, said about the Romanians that we practice the art of surgery, they practice butchery. That is inevitable in an ethnic state based on religion. In Britain, do, do my rights differ from someone who's, who's Christian? Because I'm not Christian. No, of course not. The queen or the king is the head of the ch Christian church, but there are no rights that pertain to someone who's not Jewish that apply to people who are Jewish. That is the difference. And that is why Israel is an apartheid state. There's, of course, a, a difference uh, in a sense of the, the apartheid of South Africa, which uh, exploited the black population, whereas the Palestinian population is not exploited. It is you know, there's a get genocide going on. It is an ethnic cleansing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Israel, segregation, isn't it? It's a segregated it, society. Israel is far, far worse than South Africa. South Africa never bombed the shanty towns from the air. Israel regularly bombs the refugee camps. There really is no comparison at all. And incidentally, I, I forgot to mention to Cheryl, I don't say you're all Israelis are exterminationists. I say there is a growing exterminationist mood in Israel. And that, I think, is important to understand. What about um, Satish's question, and I shouldn't have... Uh, On Turkey. Uh, yeah. And Arab resistance. I, I confess I don't know a great deal about Turkey uh, today, certainly. I mean, Erdogan is an opportunist. I mean, he does to the Kurds very much what Israel does to the Palestinians. I mean, he is a hypocrite and a dictator. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, I mean, was uh, an empire which oppressed the Arab peoples uh, of the time and that's why they formed an alliance with Britain but it didn't do much, them much good in the long term so uh, what can you say it's uh, 
it committed a genocide of its own in, with the Armenians. So uh, there's not much to write home about it, really. Uh, with the Ottoman Empire, I also think it's 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 always good to remember that it was it was never a stable occupation. There were always nationalist movements within the uh, river to sea, and some of these nationalist movements were fighting each other. And there was also Egypt, which which wanted which would occasionally try to get control of the uh, historic Palestine not just for its own sake, but because it it needed it as a conduit to, to um, things coming from, from north of there. So the um, you fast forward today, and as far as Turkey today, I completely agree with Tony. Erdogan is a complete opportunist, and he is no friend of the Palestinians except when it suits him politically. Mm. A lot of people talk about a sort of axis of resistance as well, which includes Iran, etc. But it is not not necessarily an axis that's a, a French of the working class or you know our our focus. Okay, the last uh, question or comment is from Steve Freeman. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Tina, and uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for the talk, and also obviously for Tony and Solidarity, Tony. Now they've the Crown has managed to arrest you, and um, under all the powers that the Crown has got, of course, to uh, to um, to um, take you into custody and all the rest of it. So let us just go back to um, in, in many ways in the in the in the darkest hour. It's very difficult to see any light. It's very difficult to think what any solution could possibly be when things are so horrific and so terrible. But nevertheless, we have to keep looking for the light, even in this darkest point. And, and I guess we there are two kinds of um, solutions that people come up with. One is a democratic solution. Um, and I'll come to that in a second. And the other one, I think, is where people say, well, under socialism, all these problems will have gone away. What we really need is socialism, and that will provide us with a solution. But I want to I want to press on the democratic argument. And by that, I mean that you, you have to have a democratic aim and you have to have a democratic means. By democratic means, I mean a, a position that is supported by the majority of Palestinians and the majority of Israelis. Now, that might seem absolutely impossible. At this moment in time but i want to wind the clock back to 1947 therefore just to see where that went because in 1947 when the united nations discussed this there were three positions one was partition supported by as you've already outlined america ussr and the uk there was another position what well, one palestine which was the arab position and then some people supported um, a binational state and that was supported by Yugoslavia, India, and I think Iran. And I think it's in there where, where the argument has to, I think we have to go back to those points. Now, what happened to those positions? Well, partition has now become two states because the two state solution is only really partitioned by another name. It's kind of completing the partition. And many of us agree, and I know you do, Tony, that the two state solution, the continuation of partition is not the answer. It doesn't provide a democratic answer. So we knock that one out. Then we've got the one state solution, one state, one nation, where the one nation is Palestine. Some people argue that. And then there's one state, one nation, where the one state, one nation is Israel, greater Israel. And I think, Tony, you gave the answer to apartheid. It becomes more obviously apartheid. We think really that Israel controls the whole territory, in effect. And therefore, half the people don't have a vote at all. But there aren't any elections for those in the West Bank and Gaza, as you say, amongst all the other points that you made. But I still think we have to come back to looking at the idea of one state. There has to be a one state solution. And I think that binational state is where we need to look, where we need to dig around and see in this darkest hour, the possibility of a democratic answer in the idea of a one state, two nations solution i'll just leave it there also, uh, any comments per, on that if per, got personally to. i am against a binational state i think it's it is simply uh, reframing the the essential problem 
Um, I think the only answer is a single state. And I think the way it will eventually be achieved is through the simple argument that everybody in this area from the river to the sea should have equal rights. Once that's established that there's, there's no excuse for d denying everybody equal rights, then the Israeli state ceases to exist. Uh, Tony, what do you think? Well, I agree with you. Uh, I'm opposed to binationalism. Uh, there was a small section of the Zionists, Judah Magnus, Judah Magnus Einstein, was, yes. Einstein, I think Martin Buber, who supported binationalism, and, and Hashem Hatzair, which later became Mapam, also, but in practice, I don't think it ever did, but it, it, it nominally it did until the, the war started. But if you had a binational state today, it would simply mean that Zionism would resurface under another name. I, I don't think, because uh, I don't accept that the Israeli settlers, the Ju Israeli Jewish settlers are a nation, or if they are, they're an oppressor nation, so they have no right to self-determination, because self-determination means the right to be free from national oppression. Well, they're not nationally oppressed. The only solution is a South Africa one, which is a unitary state where it doesn't matter what color or race or whatever, uh, configuration you give that you have equal rights. Of course, that uh, leaves aside the social question, which is uh, the redistribution of wealth and who controls that society. But uh, uh, certainly, I, uh, a unitary state is. I, I, just to state. add to that, which I'm sure uh, Tony and Tina will agree, that equal rights, river to sea, means by definition, that every refugee has the right to return. You you can't ethnically cleanse somebody and then say that equal rights doesn't apply to you because you're not present. No. E equal rights in a single state means that any refugee that wishes to returns or is uh, given some, some uh, compensation paid for by the countries that caused this problem, principally the, uh, the UK and the US. There's, of course, a, people like Moshe Machova argue that um, this actually cannot be solved within the you know, boundaries of Israel, Palestine, and it needs yeah, a I agree. regional I agree. Uh, solution and uh, a revolution in the Arab countries to get rid of those dictators running, running those countries, because uh, one state, two state without anything changing ever will just possibly reverse the pose of oppression, or perhaps it will just you know, create uh, the same situation again on a, on a, on a, on another level. But this is not, that wasn't the session where we, we wanted to talk about the solutions, which is, which is a, a tricky one, but we, it was really important today to look at back at the role of Britain in particular uh, in pushing forward the Zionist um, enterprise, the Zionist state and supporting that um, and the Balfour Declaration, et cetera. And both speakers have made a, a really good um, introductions and and answered patiently the many questions on on those issues, and you know the the fact that Tony was arrested yesterday for being critical of Israel certainly shows why this is so hugely important to get right and to understand what's happening. Um, you know where Israel now is being used to suppress free speech as well. You're not allowed to be critical of Israel. Anti-Semitism has been redefined from hostility to Jews to hostility to Israel. Any criticism of Israel now is being shut down with the toughest uh, sanctions by the state, which is really important that we show solidarity to Tony and um, also Mick Napier, who's been arrested, I understand, at a demonstration in, in Glasgow for saying something critical of Israel or said, mentioning the word Hamas, I think was was his crime. Absolutely ridiculous. And it's just important that shows like this show uh, stand up to this, understand what's really going on beyond beyond the, the headlines. We're going to take a Christmas break and we're coming back on January the 11th, taking a look at um, Norman Finkelstein's brilliant, brilliant book, The, the Holocaust Industry. I urge comrades to read it beforehand. Um, we'll have an introduction by Ian Spencer, and I'm sure we're going to have a really good discussion. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tony. Tony, I hope you get all your computers and phones back soon. Uh, oh, well, yes. I've got one drive, so I'll get my files back anyway. Good, good. What a nightmare. Thank you very much both for joining us Thank tonight. You. Thank you for okay. the audience for your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.